Today we are going to talk about anger. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I read the studies again. Uh, of those 400 emotions that we feel, uh, scientists feel like at least one to three times a day, people get really mad. Uh, is that true in your life? Maybe you're more. You're like, that's low. Uh, maybe you're kind of one of the calm people, and you're like, oh, that seems like a lot. Uh, but all of us deal with anger. I want you to turn to someone next to you as we kind of uh, get going in this vein. Uh, tell them the last time you got angry and what it was about. Maybe they were there. <laughs> I don't want to pick scabs here. But uh, tell them the last time you were angry and what it was about. Go. <laughs> I'm creating all kinds of trouble today, aren't I? Some of you went fast. You were there. You were like, oh, yeah. Let me hit this with you again. Yeah. All right. We're going to talk about how you should have handled that uh, and see how you did. But uh, you want to hear mine? It, it, was anybody else's anger thing just completely stupid? Isn't it amazing? No, I mean, some of you aren't, you know, no, everything I get angry about is very important, Mark. <laughs> Super valid. I'm mad at you. Anyway, uh, Mine was stupid. I came home uh, on Monday night. Uh, we had, uh, it's a long story. I'll try to keep it short. But we, had, we, don't, we don't drink milk in our house anymore. We're just, we don't have our kids in there. We aren't milk drinkers. And so uh, uh, for whatever reason, a gallon of milk showed up in our house during the storm. And uh, it was still good. Still had like 10 days left on it, right, before it was bad. Half a gallon of milk just sitting there. And I'm not, I used to eat cereal all the time. Fruit Loops was my favorite. Found out some bad things about Fruit Loops. But anyway, uh, uh, but I just haven't had a bowl of cereal. And so has anybody not had something for a long time and you know that there's this opportunity, you know, if you, if you just take advantage of it. And so I went to the store and I discovered this. There is an extra raisin raisin bran available to us now. And I don't know if you eat a raisin bran, but I don't eat the raisin bran for the bran. I eat it for the raisins, okay? And I found this box that is like, hey, uh, there's more raisins in here than bran. And I'm like, that is mine. And I am going home and I'm going to eat for dinner <laughs> extra raisin raisin bran with the milk that is in my fridge. Problem, when I got home, my beautiful bride, who before she left for work that morning, I had left earlier, had started to clean out our fridge and did the math. We don't drink milk. She was not outside of her purview. She said, well, this is just gonna go rotten. And so she had taken the gallon of milk and poured it down the sink. <laughs> As I come, you know, and so listen, guys, I did the whole thing, bowl out, bowl, uh, brazen bran poured, I got the spoon in there, and I'm like, <laughs> and I open the door, Ichabod, right? You know, it's a, uh, that's a Hebrew word for morning. Anyway, uh, uh, I was like, no, she did it. Who's ever said that about your spouse or, yeah, uh, and I mean, I went from zero to, to 100. I, I was livid. Cooper was in the room. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? There's no milk. Ah. And I immediately grabbed my phone. Yeah. Because <laughs> someone needed to know. I knew she was in a meeting. She had meetings all day Monday, a 12-hour day for Eleanor. And so I knew she wouldn't pick up her phone, so I started hammering out that text. Who's hammered out that text? How dare you? I didn't say it that way, relax. But I hammered out some pretty passive aggressive, um, regrettable sentences. And then the, the Holy Spirit got back in, in play. Has anybody ever done, I hope you've done this. Have you ever looked at a text, you're like, oh no. I cannot push send on that. Some of you are lousy at not pushing send. Your fingers are way too fast with send. Okay, I'm gonna encourage you as part of this message, learn to say no to send. By the grace of God, I said no to send. In fact, by the grace of God, I calmed down enough uh, to actually just write my wife a sweet text and say, hey babe, I know it's been a long day, I can't wait to see you, I'll see you when you get home. Did we talk about the milk when she got there? Yeah, we did, we did, we talked about it. <laughs> but the tone was completely different as to what it would have been had I pushed send. Are you with me? Yeah. Stupid, inane, extra raisin, raisin brand, and half a gallon of milk. And I was about to make it a hard week for our marriage. 
and you laugh at me, and you do the exact same thing. Because we're lousy at times in rightly dealing with the anger that we naturally feel. The Bible's full of angry stories. I've preached a bunch of them on this subject for the years that I've been with you. I could have preached today on the most famous, perhaps, of the anger stories in the Bible. Uh, twice Jesus clears the temple, once at the beginning of his ministry years, once at the end in Matthew. He's at the, at the cleansing that's at the end in Matthew chapter uh, 21, verse 12. It says that Jesus enters the temple and drives out those who sold and bought in the temple. Don't, don't have time to get into all this, but there was basically you know, crookery. There was extortion going on inside the temple. If you wanted to give a, 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 a sacrifice, which you were required to have animals to do so, the people selling them there were in like the airport times 10. Are you with me? Like everything just went up. Like in fact, I read this this week, startled me. On the street you could buy, uh, you know, doves for a sacrifice if you were a poor person because the poor people were allowed to bring doves and not lambs. But you could buy doves for like four farthings or whatever that is. And inside the temple it was 75 farthings if you forgot to buy your doves outside. Are you seeing what I'm saying? And so this was what was going on. And it says that when Jesus saw this, he, he drove out and, uh, all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned tables uh, of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you, prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Uh, Jesus got mad. He, he got mad and acted on his anger in this particular case. Um, Jesus models for us in this uh, story what our anger should be focused on. His, his anger is not for himself, it's for his father. Right? And, and so if, if you want to know whether your anger is righteous or not, who's it for? Are you angry because you're losing or are you angry because God's losing? If your anger is self-focused and self-driven, you're probably heading in a bad direction. Okay? But if your anger is seeking uh, to you know, uh, secure the, the, the righteousness of God, the honoring of God, well, he's okay with that. A defense of those being abused in violation of God's standards. Jesus wasn't just mad at the, you know, the money collectors for what they were doing to God's house. He was mad at the money collectors for what he was doing to God's people, what they were doing to God's people. They were, ripped, they were making it hard to worship God. And he came to the defense of those uh, who were being taken advantage of. Uh, I looked for it. I couldn't find in all the Gospels an instance where Jesus was angry on behalf of himself. Isn't that wild? Like all the times that he was mistreated and abused, especially during uh, his trials before his crucifixion, he never raises a hand. I would have. Anybody, if you were the son of God and you had all power in creation and someone yanked on your beard, is that guy a pile of dust like right away? Yeah. But he never did. In fact, after he's done, I never read this in the story before. After he's done wrecking the temple, you know what Matthew reports next? Look what it says. The blind and the lame came to Jesus in the temple, the same one he's just wrecked. And there he healed them. How are you at getting over your anger? Want to go heal some people right after you're done? I mean, that's probably beyond our purview, but, but usually there's a longer burn. Has anybody gotten angry and everybody just, they know to just stay out of your way? It's going to be a minute. They're going to need to calm down. Don't bring that up. Eggshells, right? No. Jesus gets angry, flips some tables, says what he needs to say in defense of his father and those that he loves, and then gets right back to doing what he was here to do in the first place, which is heal and restore and extend God's grace. How are you with that? Now, if you took Jesus and made him a pie chart, anger, just a little sliver. Grace, compassion. Yeah, he's... He's all about those things, and we should be too. So I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not preaching that today. I just did. Anyway, uh, I also thought I could preach from James, which is what we just read last month, if you were here with us, uh, where James says this in chapter one. He says, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Anybody heard this one before? Yeah. Uh, uh, he basically says, hey, guys, fast ears, slow tongues. <laughs> Uh, in, in, the, in the time that it takes for you to get angry, try to, try to pump some fruit in there, bring the basket, the whole thing. How about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Think those might have something uh, or some, some sort of influence on your anger if you can bring them into play? 
I mean, it's like slow down. I read this one article on psychology today that says basically there's four stages to anger. As a counselor, you're supposed to talk about these. Uh, you, you get annoyed, you get frustrated, uh, but then those inner feelings and thoughts become your outer actions and words. And so you go from frustration to hostility, and from hostility to rage. And what James is basically saying here is like, hey man, uh, as you're starting to feel that frustration and feel your emotions bubbling over, let's bring Jesus into this thing. Slow down, quick ears, slow tongues, and be slow to become angry. So that means when you're behind the guy at the light who's on his phone and you feel annoyed, and then uh, the light turns green, and they're still not moving, and now you're frustrated, so you give them the, the gentle two toots. Boop, boop, right? But still not paying attention because his music is so loud, he can't hear you, and you feel that hostility, and it comes out in your verbal comments. Don't repeat them in here. And your smacking of the wheel. And then the final uh, act is what? Elbow on the horn. Is anybody else an elbow on the horn person? Burr! Just me? Okay. <coughs> then you're so mad, you can't even see straight. He makes the light. Either you're stuck or you break the law and go through the light and ride up next to them. <laughs> and then have a bad day. How about at that line where we're frustrated? Slow down. It's not that big a deal. It's a, it's a stoplight. It's Raisin Bran. It's not a big deal. Honor God in this impulse of annoyance and frustration. Do not let it become hostility and rage. James goes on and says, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Everybody say that one with me. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. One more time. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Can he say it any more clearly? If you are given over to anger and you excuse yourself for being that way because it's how my dad was. Listen, your standard is not your father. As great a man as he was, he is not the father. Our standard is our heavenly father, what he wants. And your anger, no matter how much you make excuses for it, is taking you away if you're using it the wrong way and doing it the wrong way. It's taking you away from the righteousness that God would have for you. If I could have preached that one, either one of those, but I'm not going to. Instead, I'm going to preach you this one. Psalm 4. Never preach this one when it comes to anger. Uh, it's kind of a, a sister psalm to the psalm before it in Psalm 3. In Psalm 3, uh, if you're there, you can go to your Bibles, we're going to be in Psalm 4. But in Psalm 3, it, it starts out this way. It's a, a psalm uh, that basically uh, is written by David when he fled from his son Absalom. Don't have a long time to do his uh, whole background here, but David uh, messes up. Uh, makes some mistakes, uh, is, is uh, punished by the loss of, of his son with Bathsheba, and then is, is uh, further punished by his other son, Absalom, uh, usurping his authority and, and taking his throne. Fascinating story, uh, but Absalom is making trouble, like uh, Saul before him, before David became Kim, king, Absalom is making trouble for his dad. And, and so David writes a psalm, Psalm 3, uh, about you know, his, his needs in the wake of Absalom's terror and Absalom's uh, uh, usurping his throne. Uh, he writes this couplet, this second uh, song, Psalm 3, uh, as kind of a, uh, uh, an addendum. Uh, uh, sometimes rock albums will start with a song and uh, that's the big hit and then they'll play like a reprisal of it at the end of the album. Does everybody remember albums? Who remembers albums? Anybody? Some of the youngers are like, what are you speaking of? Anyway, uh, uh, it's the same kind of deal. I'm going to just walk through these verses briefly, and we're going to learn from God how he wants us further to handle our anger. David wrote the song uh, and started this way. Answer me when I call, O God, verse 1. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Uh, David's penning a petition, a prayer to the God of his righteousness. I love that he says it that way. He's basically saying, hey God, I know that I have nothing righteous in me, but you are the God who helps me do right and the God who does right by me. You're the God of my righteousness. 
Um, he says, you have given me relief uh, when I was in distress. It's a call back to all the many ways that God has answered his prayers before. And now he says, be gracious to me and hear this current prayer. He moves from uh, beseeching God in prayer in this song that he writes to addressing his oppressors and their oppression of him. Speaking specifically to Absalom, most scholars believe, and his followers, he says this, O men, it's actually O royal men in the Hebrew, but O men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? He says selah there, it's a Hebrew word that basically means um, a pause in the text, it's a poetic effect in Hebrew poetry, uh, but it's a word that means forever. Uh, And it just is uh, used to kind of emphasize what the writer writes. Uh, It's a question that he asks of his oppressors, Absalom and his court. Hey, how long are you guys going to be talking smack about me? (laughs) Turn my honor into shame. How long are you going to use vain words and lies to, to attack me and to undermine my authority? It's a confrontation. Uh, He's annoyed. He's frustrated. It's what happened at what's happening in his kingdom. He feels unduly and unfairly treated. So he has this imaginary talk with his offenders. Anybody ever had one of these? Ooh, if I could give that guy a piece of my mind, here's what I'd say. It's like me typing the Raisin Bran text. Oh, here we go. Yeah, we we have those things in our minds. And David is sharing his thoughts with his God. But what comes next is our instruction as we leave today. When life makes us angry, how should we react? Three things. When we get annoyed and frustrated and verge on hostility and rage, three things. The first one David mentions is this. Remember that God has our back. Look what he says. He's saying this to the oppressors. He says, know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. I got the red phone. (laughs) Some people think pastors have a red phone and go straight to heaven. We don't. Our prayers are heard just like yours. Everybody got that? But what David's saying is this. It's like, hey, I don't have to worry about you and your shenanigans because I serve a God who is aware, all-powerful, and who has uh, set apart the godly for himself. Uh, It's this really interesting Hebrew phrasing. He basically says in that phrase, I know I've been set apart by God for what I'm doing. He anointed me through Samuel to be king of Israel. I am his set apart one. And because I am chosen or anointed by God, set apart by him, loved by him, I can trust him to have my back. The Lord hears me when I call. So I don't have to seek revenge. Really, that line between annoyance and frustration, when we get to hostility and rage, it's mostly about revenge, right? Like, we're so mad that we're going to tell you, and we're going to tell you in unflattering ways, and we're going to try to hurt you because you've hurt us. Anybody done that one? Had that argument? Uh, Anger and and vengeance go together. Anger is the emotion you feel. Vengeance is the result that you seek. And the Bible has a lot to say about that, most principally in Romans, Well, Paul writes this to his readers there. He says, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. He says, if it's possible, so far as it's up to you or depends on you, live at peace. We are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, right? We're meant to be the ones that when we get angry, we we don't seek to get even. I don't get mad. I get even. That's a horrible statement. It's not our ethic It's not how we who are in Christ and who seek to follow him live. When I get angry, I seek peace, even if I'm the offended and not the offender. He goes on and he says this, beloved, never avenge yourselves, except for that one time. Is that what it says? Here's the exceptions. No, he says never. Never offend yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it's written, he quotes the Old Testament, vengeance is mine, I repay, says the Lord's. To the contrary, he says, here he goes, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil. Read anger and the vengeance that it will inspire. 
Do not be overcome by the urge to venge or be venged, uh, avenged. Instead, overcome evil with good. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 5. You've heard it said, uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. Anybody remember that one? That's, that's, that's vengeance, right? You get to do what's been done to you, payback. But then he says, if you're slapped, turn your other cheek. If you're sued for your shirt, give him your coat. If you're forced to walk a mile, walk an extra mile. I thought that'd be a good mantra to have when you get mad. So you're in traffic and you're behind the guy who's on his phone and he's not moving, right? And you're feeling unjustly you know, provoked. Uh, try this one with me. Cheek, coat, extra mile. Cheek, coat, extra mile. Cheek, coat, extra mile. Try it. Cheek, coat, extra mile. Cheek, coat, extra mile. You're not doing it. Do it with me. Cheek, coat, extra mile. Cheek, coat, extra mile. Cheek, coat, extra mile. Cheek, coat, extra mile. Whatever you got to do. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. Whatever you have to do to remember who you are. You and, if you're a Christian, look at me, Christians. If you're a Christian, you have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer you who live, but it is Christ who lives in you. And he's the one who said, cheek, coat, extra mile. Calm down. And move forward to the glory of God. So the first thing we do so remember that God's got our back. The second thing we do is we deal with anger while refusing to sin. See if this verse doesn't sound familiar. Verse four says, be angry and do not sin. Wait for it, I'm gonna get to it. Be angry and do not sin. In this psalm, this poem, he says, ponder in your hearts on your beds and be silent. Some great Hebrew words. The word for anger there is the Hebrew word ragas. In other translations, it's, it's uh, uh, translated as tremble. Like to, to physically and, and shake. Like so, so we're, we're way past uh, annoyance and frustration. We're in the territory of hostility and rage. Are you with me? He's like, hey, I know you feel like you want to do that. You want to tremble. You want to uh, get a, a revenge. But don't. Instead, ponder in your hearts on your beds. Slow down. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to become angry. Uh, the words there for ponder is the Hebrew word amar. It means to meditate or to, uh, to say to yourself. That's what meditation is, just repeating a phrase over and over again and thinking those sorts of words. So, kind of like cheek, coat, extra mile. It's just ponder these things. And then the big one is be silent. Now, that doesn't mean stuff it. It's another sermon for another day. I don't think you should stuff your emotions, okay? But when it comes to you being ruled by your emotions and your emotions ruining your relationships, don't say that stuff. Erase that text. Go in a different direction. Be angry and do not sin. That's in the New Testament. Paul uh, just lifts it from uh, Psalm chapter four and in uh, verse 26 of Ephesians four, he says, be angry and do not sin. He goes on and he gives a time uh, notation to it. He says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. So be uh, angry right and do it in a timely fashion. Why? Because there's so many other sins uh, that are born of unresolved anger. Bitterness, wrath, malice. These are cousins, branches from the trunk that is your anger. He says, deal with it. What that means in your relationships is talk about it, even if it's hard. Eleanor and I had a fight last week. I'm not going to tell you what it was about, but it was a hard 45 minutes in our house. Neither of us wanted to discuss the subject. Both of us thought we were right. Had that one? But the longer you talk rightly... Key, not throwing, <laughs> not yelling. I'm going to win the volume contest. No, rationally, lovingly, clearly expressing uh, in ways that can be heard. When you say this, it makes me feel. I know you love me, and you never want me to feel that way. Let's talk about this. There's right ways to do this. 
and you should do it in a timely fashion so as not to be ruled by your anger. James fin- or, excuse me, Paul finishes his writing uh, or his lifting of this note from Psalm 4 by saying, give no opportunity to the devil. It's a Greek word that basically means foothold or space. Don't let the devil get his toe in the door. Uh, it's, it, to my knowledge, it's the only sin spoken of in, in this way. Anger lets the devil's toe in the door. It is the gateway to all kinds of iniquity, all kinds of craziness. So remember that God's got your back. Deal with your anger without sinning. And then this last one's my favorite. Choose worship and trust over anger. It's a simple verse. It's like 10 words. Uh, Not even that much in Hebrew. But it says, offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. Offer right sacrifices. Instead of being angry, go to the temple or go to God and offer right sacrifices. Now, it's the Old Testament. Most of us aren't steeped in what those were. There were three principal kinds of sacrifices. Can I tell you about them? Doesn't matter. Here it comes. The first one's this. There was a sin offering. Uh, uh, Yom Kippur just happened a few weeks ago, right? It was the Day of Atonement in Israel. They would actually take a, a calf and, and the, uh, the high priest would put his hands on the calf as he was about to, to end the calf's life and sacrifice it on the altar. But that hand on the calf was basically a picture of the sins of Israel being imputed to that animal. And his death is the sacrifice that God required for the forgiveness of those sins. Now, we don't have to, who's grateful that we don't live in the age where we gotta take animals to church anymore? Is anybody grateful for that? Uh, We have our sacrificial lamb in Jesus. His death is the sacrifice given for all sins. But the point of the sin offering was confession. Connection with the fact that I blew it. Listen, if you get angry and you sin, that's not just. That's not right. That was wrong. And so David's you know, basically talking to these, these courtiers of Absalom, and he says, hey, you guys, how long are you going to talk smack and, and ruin our country through this uprising? <laughs> Be angry and don't sin, he tells them. Lie on your beds and sort this stuff out. And then, instead of being angry with me and prolonging what's uh, causing all this strife, go to the temple and confess your sin. Get right before God in the area of your anger. The second kind of offerings were burnt offerings. Now, they would take the sacrifice and they would basically burn it until there was nothing left. And it was a picture of of, uh, uh, the totality of our submission to God. Everything is yours. I just quoted the verse. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live. I have disappeared in this relationship with him. And my rights and entitlements no longer exist. I live for him and him alone. Ancient Israelites were reminded of this when they did burnt offerings. Everything is God's, including me. And then finally, there's peace offerings. These are a little happier. Peace offerings were given at a certain feast where you would offer as a, a partial sacrifice parts of the animal, but then you would eat the rest of the animal in a celebration with those that would come to dinner, okay? So we're gonna have turkeys here in a few uh, weeks. Uh, I don't know what the rest of you do with that stuff that's inside. That's gross, right? The heart and the neck, I throw that out. But then everybody comes over and eats the rest of that bird, okay? Sorry, vegetarians, but uh, they're delicious, right? It's the same kind of picture, We're giving portions to God, but we're remembering that uh, we have relationships with God that enable us to have relationships with each other. What a great picture if you've been mad at someone. Go confess it. Worship that way. Go get rid of yourself. That's the burn offering. And then seek peace with those uh, that your anger has separated you from. He says, offer right sacrifices and finally put your trust in the Lord that's said a couple different times in scripture, right? And, and it, it's, it applies to our anger. Instead of trusting you and seeking your own vengeance, trust in him. Cheek, coat, extra mile. I'm out of time. I asked you to tell a story about your most recent anger. How'd you do? I get to tell you know, the, the wind story that I had I, that doesn't always happen, just so we're clear. 
Sometimes I push send. Sometimes I say the things that I regret and have to apologize for. You do too. But now you know. And maybe you can even go back as you, uh, you know, talk as you leave uh, about that instance that you got mad about. And you can evaluate. And I, I trust some of you here, you nailed it. You did it exactly right. As you got annoyed and frustrated, you didn't bridge into hostility and rage and you honored God with it and you did the right thing. And you, uh, good, great. Some of you didn't. Uh, most of us don't. At least one time or another. But isn't it great to know that the Lord who has blessed us with his presence in life, the Lord who has given us life, if we are a follower of Jesus Christ and if you're kind of new to the whole deal, that's what this whole thing's about, okay? You are dead in your transgressions and sins, the Bible says, but you can be alive through Christ and faith in him. And those of us who walk with Jesus and have life with him, we call ourselves Christ followers, we have been blessed by him to have a new shot at life, a different kind of life. A life that not only honors him and brings him the glory that he deserves, but a life that blesses us and brings us the good that we don't deserve. And it comes down to our choices. And so now, may God grant us his grace to understand that the anger of man does not bring about or jive with the righteousness of God. Will you stand with me as we sing today?